Hi, welcome to the Fascinating Womanhood channel. I'm Dixie Ann Forsyth, and I have a very special guest today. It's Dr. John Gray, the author of the very, very famous book, Men Are From Mars, Women From Venus. And I've, I've known about this book for many years, and I'm sure all of you have too. So welcome to Fascinating Womanhood. Oh, thank you so much, Dixie. It's really a pleasure. It lit up my day knowing that I was going to be talking to you, your, your mother's book, and then you're continuing on with your more books on Fascinating Womanhood. Uh, I have mm -hmm. to thank, thank your mother and for that book, because when I fell in love with my wife, Bonnie, of 34 years, uh, she was practicing that book. And that helped mm -hmm. me develop my ideas of men are from Mars, women are from Venus, because wow. she was so much, uh, in a sense, more feminine, or I would just say more enlightened, wiser uh, than all the women I was counseling, because they hadn't read that book. So I, I got to see the contrast of uh, where women were and where they can move to. And then, of course, the other side of it is where men are, where men can move to, and how we just don't understand our own personal power in relationships. If I can summarize, and then we'll continue our conversation. But the, um, I talk about the female side of everybody. That female side of everybody, man or woman, has the power to attract support, to get other people to delegate, to not have to do it all yourself. And the male side is, look what I can do myself. And today, women are so much on their male side, they're busy going, look what I can do myself. And then they're unhappy because they're not nourishing and supporting their female power, which is to be in relationship and not do everything, but learn how to receive more. And your mother had it down. I'll have to say it was wonderful. Yeah, I, pre I appreciate that. And um, I remember reading your book. I don't know. It came out in the 90s, did it not? Yeah, 92, 92. Yeah, I remember reading it and thinking it was really, really good. I love the, I love the uh, concept of the the men are from Mars. It, everybody can see that. Everybody can imagine that, that they're yes. so different. And, and I like the man cave and, and, and all that. That's really affected me and um, how men kind of go into sort of a virtual cave. Now, some people think it's like they really have to have a room called the man cave, but it you don't really don't, don't have, yeah. to have that. It's fun to have that, but it's not necessary. And also, you know, what I didn't talk about in men are from Mars, you know, this is now 28 years later. And also I've been teaching in 45 years. Uh, they, these ideas there's always a yes, but okay. Men need their cave time. And yes, sometimes men do unproductive things in the cave. <laughs> so, and uh, we'll take, for example, porn, uh, any, the cave oh, yeah. time is a time for him to rebuild his testosterone yes. by a hobby or something he's good at or quieting the mind or reading the news, forgetting about his problems. That's the whole thing. Uh, Cause if a man has problems that he can't solve, uh, he's frustrated and his testosterone goes down. But if he right. says, to, if he can say to himself, don't worry about it, I'll handle it tomorrow. No big deal. We need a, little distraction from our problems in order to uh, do something to generate testosterone, which is doing anything you're good at, which is impersonal. Uh, impersonal activity is one of the most powerful things to raise testosterone, but then have personal activity. Uh, if your testosterone is up, then it can make it go even higher, but we need that. And today it's what I'm saying is that you go to your cave to produce testosterone. Actually, when you do porn, you temporarily produce massive amounts of, of testosterone and then it's gone. Okay, it just drops back down. You can't sustain it because it's based on fantasy and digital stimulation and digital stimulation and fantasy always bump your testosterone up much higher than you can maintain. It literally crashes back down. And over time, you lose your testosterone if you're male. So what we see quite, quite commonly in males at 20 years old, even 20% lower testosterone levels on average, not every male, but on average in America, 20% uh, lower now than just 20 years ago. So this is radical changing happening. Yeah, and that's really interesting. And uh, kind of along that line, it's not the direct subject, but I, I wanted to ask you because there's been so many um, shootings and uh, mass shootings in the United States lately, um, school shootings and mall shootings, and they're they're virtually all, if not all, done by young men. And I, yes. I wanted to get your thoughts on why you think young men are doing doing this. And, and, you know, it's not really young women. It's it's young men. No, and no, it's it's males. What happened? This is another take on it that most people don't have the science, and so they, uh, first of all, they think it's just guns. Now, certainly, guns are part of the problem. But uh, if you take away, I'm just going to say this. I know it's not unpopular, but if everybody takes away the guns, the criminals will find guns. <laughs> then, then you're helpless. You know. So well, so there, we, there's also there, I'm sorry. There's also pipe bombs and baseball bats and yes, knives. Yes, and, yes, yes. And, and more depth on that than guns. Uh, absolutely. So anyway, having said that. Mm -hmm. What makes it young men? And we should point out that it's not just young men, it's fatherless young men. That means they don't have a I father think. figure in their life. Mm -hmm. That then gives rise to other emotional problems. You see, the male side of us is it has no emotion. Just to understand the biology of testosterone is no emotion. It's analysis, it's detachment, 
It's not emotional. But the female side of us, and I have it as a man, every man does, that, that's the estrogen. When estrogen is being produced in my body, I will have emotion, whether it be the emotion of joy and happiness, or if my testosterone is low, it will be the emotion of anger and fear. It will be fight or flight. So you can measure this in men. When they have uh, a stress response, the fight or flight response, their uh -huh. testosterone levels are low and their female hormones are high. And this is because they don't have the training of just being next to a father while you're growing up who doesn't get emotional about everything. Uh, we've just become too emotional. It's like the, that's the supreme thing. And no, detachment is just as important. Learning how to suck it up and not indulge in what you feel every moment of the day is very important for everybody, but more important for men. Uh, I give you an example. Just today, uh, I was counseling a client and it was a single woman who really wasn't interested in men at all. She sort of done it, been married, but her son, uh, it takes tennis lessons from the tennis coach. And, and she never found mm -hmm. him attractive in any way. He's just a teacher of her son. And, and then- He's in, a, he's in a championship match. Okay. He's in a, a match competing and then he missed the ball and he, he crashed down. He started crying and his mother went over to him and it's going to be okay. I love you and all this stuff. You don't have to cry. And the boy just kept crying and crying. And then the coach came over and said, let me, let me talk to him. Just go on back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the coach says, Hey, you don't need to cry about this. Just suck it up. Get out there. You're going to win this match. I know it. You can do it. Don't worry about it. I'm right behind you. And if you lose, no big deal. And if you win, you'll, you'll be the king. And I think you can win. He went back in. I don't know if those were his exact words, but he went back in and he uh, won the championship. And the woman <laughs> fell in love. Suddenly she's in love with this guy. She was the very, you know, what's going on inside of me? She felt like a teenager in love. It's simply because here's a man taking care of her son, but he can only right. do that because he's a man. See, it's right. like when you're a boy is with a man, we learn a very, a very important lesson, which is you don't have to get so upset about stuff. You just say, forget it, suck it up. What can you do about it? Get out there and do it and have someone mm -hmm. who supports you in that, who believes in you. And all of these shooters without, without question, all had absent fathers. They didn't have that to a certain extent. They had unhappy mothers, which is devastating to a boy, uh, you know, which is you know, as your mother's book, Fascinating Womanhood, and now your books explain that when, when a woman is not happy and fulfilled within herself then a man just loses his energy. He loses his motivation, his desire to please and so forth. Why would I want to work hard at, at a job if they don't pay me? Or here's another yeah. point. Why would I want to work hard at a job if somebody else can get paid the same amount and do nothing? That's just- That's true. Yeah. That's, that's why authoritarian communism is a bad thing. People don't mm -hmm. realize that. They say, well, we should all just be motivated. No, we're not. We're motivated. <laughs> You know, it, it, that's why when you work harder, when you got children and a wife who depend on you, you get, I got to get out there and do it. If you don't have to do it, testosterone doesn't go up. Estrogen goes up and estrogen for a man, too much of it without testosterone is weakness. It's addiction. It's doing what you like to do, doing what you enjoy to do, doing what's fun to do. And then you find that you're depressed and you're powerless and you procrastinate. It's all just too much estrogen in the male body. Having said that, you ask, why are these boys doing that? Well, on a, just on a biological level, their estrogen levels are way higher than their masculine. Anger in a male is estrogen. That's what people don't understand. They think it's high testosterone that produce aggression and testosterone. No, aggression is produced from a lot of frustrated anger and or flight or running away. And so they go back and forth running away or fighting. If they have played video games or they have seen war, uh, they, if they've seen abuse, they tend to go mm. to fight. Uh, if I was in a fight or flight response, I rarely ever could go into an aggressive response because I've never experienced it. My parents raised me without punishment. So violence was never a solution. But when you're raised with violence as a solution to getting what you want, then when a male's in fight or flight, he now goes into an aggressive stance rather than a pulling away stance. So many women go, why does he go to his cave? Well, that's his, he's in fight or flight. <laughs> he's in pulling away and he's protecting you from the dragon inside. You need to reframe your understanding of what's going on here. That's just that one piece of information there. So we come back to all of these boys are also on antipsychotic drugs. So the, oh, really? that's the cause. I didn't, of it. Can, yeah, oh, I, didn't, all, I did not know that. Okay. They're not allowed to put that on the news. It's actually the pharmaceutical. Oh. So they'll basically pull their ads. If you look on TV, all the ads are, it's primarily promoted by pharmaceuticals, good old Pfizer oh. and all the others. Wow. But there's not, there's not a case. Uh, there's a book written on, on this, which has the documentation of, of a woman who goes into the court in order to sue the, um, the pharmaceutical companies, countries, companies mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So the idea here is, these boys are already troubled in their life. They, and so the remedy of giving them psychotropic drugs, uh, psychotic drugs, uh, antidepressants, even you can look on all of those drugs and the, and the 
potential side effect, not every child, but the potential side effect is suicide and killing and violence. Suicide and violence are really, uh, yes, it's right on the label. It's go online and look at the thing. Uh, this is so, this is so interesting because I did, I did not know that. Now I, in researching for my book that I wrote, I learned that, and I'm sure you already know this, but um, when you look at the news, when you look at the news and you see riots, you see these riots, if you look at who's rioting, they're almost always young men. They're not usually older men or family men or, or sometimes there's young women in there, but they're overwhelmingly young men, kind of like the school shooters, uh, only they're kind of in mass. Another part Some of, of the being young men, okay, is that young men uh, don't have any, any sense of accomplishment or training. As you get older and you're a man, uh, usually you've got a job. Okay. Yeah. And so that becomes a fuel for you to produce mm -hmm. testosterone. See for males, well-being is primarily based upon having a job that's meaningfully acknowledged. And we mm -hmm. see even more violence today uh, as we've created, you know, with the George Floyd thing, uh, yeah. which was, you know, violence and it was, but to be, to see it on TV over and over and over, there used to be a rule on TV that you're never allowed to show direct killing somebody. You, you can, you can shoot a gun, and then you can see somebody on the ground, but you can't put the gun to their head and witness shooting somebody. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And so because we sat there and watched it over and over and over, the brain mm -hmm. doesn't realize that this is an isolated, rare, extremely rare case. What is it like a hundred times, hundred amazing statistics you don't hear on TV when you realize how mm -hmm. many policemen are killed by black people, as opposed to how right. many policemen <laughs> killed black people unfairly. So the brain doesn't get a, the whole picture. It gets exaggerated into we're being mistreated over and over. And then with the whole Black Lives Matter thing, and then the, the focusing on slavery and everything, it's it, these young people are being taught that they're being abused all the time and somebody owes them something and they're victims. <laughs> so when you feel victim uh, and you don't have a job, which helps you mm -hmm. feel I can create success. So these are, this is an a, a age where they're basically becoming adults, but they haven't had role models to show them how to be an adult. And therefore they're feeling massively insecure at that time. You know, just like puberty uh, is a major hormonal shift. There's another brain shift that takes place around 21 where you're gonna have to be on your own. You know, it used to be when you're 21, you leave the family, you know, you're a man now, you go off. You know, mm -hmm. so that was, there's actually a brain shift that happens. <laughs> another brain shift that happens around 28 major shifts that happen in our developmental stages. And at that stage of becoming an adult, you now suddenly feel the pressure of, I have to be responsible for myself. And at that time, they just don't have enough confidence in themselves. They don't have, uh, they don't have enough presence of masculine, peaceful imp in in input. So here, here's how it looks for a, a boy when he's growing up with a father. Uh, and, and this is not a functional part of it. I'll just look at even the mm -hmm. most dysfunctional aspect of a father. The mother's all upset about something and dad rolls his eyes. <laughs> it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Even though that's dysfunctional, that's a very important message for that boy to hear. Now, what I would be teaching them is never roll your eyes when your wife is upset, but just don't get upset with her and don't get upset yourself and say, you say, okay, let's, we'll get through this. Let's, what, what can we do about this? And then tell, well, tell me more what you're feeling and what's happening. And then you can see mom calming down and dad didn't have to say, you should calm down. You see that that's not a good right. skill. But mm -hmm. the, the most important thing he gets from his father is no big deal. Don't worry about it. It's not a problem. I remember one of the examples in the book about raising boys, boy crisis. It's over here on, on my side there. The boy crisis is a massive crisis for boys today. It's a crisis in performance and achievement and success and motivation for boys. And we could, I could write a book, uh, the female crisis is not about performance. It's about happiness. It's about relationship, yeah. inability yeah. to sustain a relationship, a la the skills you teach in your book about womanhood, fascinating womanhood. <laughs> what people have to understand is that when you follow the messages you give in your book, it makes a woman fascinating to a man. See, the man is fascinated with her. He's drawn to her. It's a part of his life that he's missing. You know, when I married my wife, Bonnie, I told her after one year and she was reading your mother's book uh, and applying it on me. I told her, you know, before I met you, my life was really like black and white. I didn't realize it. I thought this is all there was to life. And, and suddenly it's like everything is in living color. You know, I have a whole richness in my oh. life that I didn't have before. And it takes a woman connected with her femininity to bring that out of a man. And it also takes a mother connected to her femininity to bring that in a boy. But if she's not happy and fulfilled through her relationships separate from the boy, okay, mm -hmm. this I'm happy and fulfilled in my relate. One source of fulfillment is my son, but in my life, I'm happy and fulfilled. If she's not happy and fulfilled to, to a great extent, the boy will try to make mom happy. He'll do his best to make mm -hmm. her mother happy. And then when he experiences, he can't, there's nothing I can do. 
then there's pain in there. There's the pain. I want my mother to be happy. And then, and then mother's telling him all the time why she's not happy. Your father's a jerk. Your father left us. He's not there for us. I have to do it all myself. Not that every woman does that, but they do it seven times more than men. That's statistics. And so she's going to go into complaining about the father. Well, she's just, she's not complaining about the father. She's hammering that little boy. You see, that he, right. he can't make her happy because he is like dad. Dad's inside of him. Yeah, so yeah that's right. Yeah. And so yeah. boys need role models of men who, are, who feel good about themselves, don't get too emotional about stuff and are, have a mission in life to various degrees. They don't have to be perfect. These boys are completely missing any of that. What they have is a dysfunctional uh, pot of, of stew of negative feelings towards men, towards their father. And that just gets thrown just off gets to him. Them. And he, he will tend to uh, act that out in a, a complete uh, fight or flight response. And because he doesn't have any role models of how to behave when you have strong emotions, like anger comes up, you have, you know, it's like my mother taught me, you know, when you're angry, use your words, don't use your fists. Okay. It's like, this is a training. Mm -hmm all monkeys inside if but when we're fight or flight goes off blood flow literally stops to the front part of the brain and these boys haven't developed you don't start developing this front part of the brain from 21 to 28 that's where you start having control over yourself and so as they're starting to feel that responsibility is i have to do it myself and then there's this huge victim victim mentality for for uh particularly what's going on with the black people right now i've seen on the news and it's even little girls too they're they're throwing stuff at policemen they're putting me in that i mean basically if if somebody was a horrible person to my family, I'd kick them out of my family and say swear words too. get out of here. I don't like because we're being told that they're not our protectors. They're the dangerous, terrible people. And there's always, as they say, mm -hmm. there's a bad apple everywhere, but they're not all bad apples. These are like the heroes of society. And they are now being pushed down. The soldiers used to be the heroes of society. And then now they're being pushed down. You know, these are things that masculinity has to find a role where it can feel successful. And if you don't have that, your testosterone can't come up. Their estrogen levels surge and they take things personally and they feel powerless. And basically a, a good phrase we use in the book is hurt people, hurt others. Uh, that's mm -hmm. usually, in most of these cases, it's a suicide act as well. I'm going to kill myself, but I'm going to kill everybody else as well. And if you actually analyze violence, now I, I, there's another way to understand it. That's one layer of the lack of role models, the lack of balanced hormones, the lack of a happy father, happy mother, you know, all that builds up. But why all the way to the point of violence? is that there's deeper, deeper issues that have to be looked at. And as soon as you go into therapy for these kids, all they're going to do is give you drugs and they keep giving you more drugs and more drugs, which don't ever allow you to look at what's causing this problem and remedy it, find a remedy for it. And mm -hmm. if you don't do that in certain kids, it's just going to, so one possible side effect it's on the, on the label is that it's violence or suicide and suicides are dramatically up. Suicides in boys are eight times higher than girls. I read online that, see if you have heard this too, that the leading cause of death in boys, other is uh, number two is number two is suicide. Number one is just accidental uh, deaths, but number two is suicide. Yeah, that would be uh, consistent with what I know to be true as well. And mm -hmm. for people to look at these things, you know, my boy crisis book has about forty pages of references to studies. I mean, it's really well documented. Wow. Yeah. I, I have to thank my co-author for that. I'm, I I just say what I think is true based on lots of things. I don't put all the references in it. Take it for leave it. If you like it, go with it. But he really likes to back it up with the science and all these things. And I, I appreciate that a lot. Yeah. Some people need to see that. But that's that's the case. If we look at big studies that have been done over the whole country, because so many people go to doctors, they keep records, they make studies on this. They're finding that every year now uh, for males, their testosterone levels are going down 1% every year. And they're starting out at 20, 20% lower. This is like, wow, no, this is wow. Why, why, why is that? Um, well, I can, I can simply say the simple answer for it. There's maybe uh, two basic reasons. Well, this is not happening to all the males, but if you look in the, right. the black community where you see a lot of anger today and a lot of rioting, you know, you saw all that Black Lives Matter stuff and we're all victims and you're burning stuff. It's like losing control. It's like you're being, being oppressed. You know, they walk around thinking they're oppressed as opposed to all the black people who feel like I got a great job. What are you talking about? You know, so there's always oppressed people in our society. And this is when you're missing parents, you tend up feeling oppressed and there's so much divorce. Yeah. There's 70% of black boys uh, don't have a relationship with their fathers. 70%, wow. 40%, 40% of white boys uh, don't have relationships with their fathers. These are shocking, shocking analysis. Shocking, yes. Stories. Yeah. And we have to just recognize without that father support, they don't, they don't love themselves. That's called self-esteem. They don't, they don't know who they are. They don't, that's a gradual process. That's why we need mentors mm -hmm. we need mentors. Uh, and now they're all trying to feminize males. You look at psychology today, which is let's talk about feelings. Poor males, you're also oppressed by a society that says you should be a fascinating woman. <laughs> I know, I know. I this is one thing I'm really glad you brought up because our culture now is teaching 
boys that masculinity is toxic. So where, where, what are they? Where do they fit? Right. I just say there's no such thing at all of toxic masculinity. What mm -hmm. there are are toxic people. And there's just as many right. toxic people as women, as men. I've never seen a relationship. Well, I have seen a few where one partner is actually more toxic than the other. But if you start where they start building it up, what you see is their behaviors are toxic to each mm -hmm. other. But femininity is beautiful and, and, and masculinity is, is heroic. Okay. you got two forces, heroic, willing. If we look at the history of men, we see that you know, again, the feminists want to say that patriarchy is toxic. Well, if you look yeah. at governments, all governments are toxic, but they're men and women and primarily men, but also That's women. True. Governments have been toxic. These are That's true. There's one out of a thousand, what is, I think it's one out of uh, one out of a hundred people are sociopaths Sociopath. and one out mm -hmm. of a thousand people are psychopaths. These are just gene problems from the heredity of being murderers in the past and whatever. And they don't have the ability to feel what another person could feel. I've taught in the prisons. I know these are psychopaths and sociopaths. Uh, you know, and, and so this is something I don't have an answer for these people except to lock them up. I and definitely yeah. don't put them and definitely don't put them in uh, uh, political positions. But they're the ones who get to the political <laughs> positions. OK, <laughs> I mean, when they have a lot of charm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Sometimes they can so be charming. charming. They're very charming. They're just they're this. They lie. They lie right to your face and you don't know it. You can't imagine that somebody could do that. They mimic and they lie and they pretend to care. What They don't. That was in my own life. Uh, as I became famous, I've been defrauded many times by people who said, really? I lied to my face, just lied to my face. Really? And I could not imagine somebody doing that uh, until now I do. I know it's possible. And I know some of the signs of it and whatever. But the, the you know, they, when you're well known, things come at you. If you're not so well known, things generally don't come at you. And I learned big lessons. That's all. But we, if we come back to you, ask the question, why, what's going on with the low testosterone with males? Another uh, the, the, the trend is men are bad rather than men are right. men are the guys that built the world. OK, they built the cities, they built the roads, they're the construction workers who want how many women today, how many feminists are doing construction workers? <laughs> and if they are, they're holding up signs for traffic. They're not doing this and this and this. They're not climbing the high buildings. They're not risking their life. So who did the, the dangerous jobs, the dirty yeah. jobs, the grimy yeah. jobs? And then some woman says to me in a class, she says, why clean poop? I said, cleaning poop is an honor for many women. At my house, when the baby had poop, the women were all taking turns. I want to take, I want to hold the baby. I'll take care of the baby. You know, yeah. Unless you're on your male side. If you're on your male side, it's kind of like, okay. But I cleaned up the poop. If nobody wants to do it, I'll do it. That's the, what men will do. They'll pick up the slack. If nobody does it, I'll do it. And, and they, they will do it if they imagine in their mind that they're going to be recognized in a heroic way, which I appreciate you. I'm glad right. you that I didn't have to do that. And again, your work on fascinating womanhood, teaching women their power, which is you appreciate right. him, you ask for help, you delight in him. It just makes him feel like he, he has meaning and significance. And these boys don't have that. So right away, that's one of the reasons the culture is making women too masculine. When a woman is on her male side, she cannot appreciate a man. Her brain will go right into looking at what's wrong with him, what's wrong with him, because she's not on her fascinating womanhood side. That's estrogen. You have to be making enough estrogen to appreciate a man. <laughs> that's all there is to it. So the next side of this, that's one thing. The culture is ruining us. Two, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of that is psychology books and therapists and whatever. I could go into great length on that. But the, that's one, the, the culture. Two, it, and let me summarize the culture in one phrase. Okay. Denormalize heterosexual marriage and family values. Denormalize. Yes. Yes. It seems like today everybody's gay, right? That gay prize. You know, we do uh, we do anniversary one day. Uh, we do the Fourth of July one day. Patriotic Americans, but we do gay pride for a month. You know, <laughs> they've got kindergartners uh, wearing gay pride things. Everybody's gay. Who gay is good? What do you pick your sex? This is pure insanity from my perspective of understanding the biology of men and women. Which is why I thought it was very funny when they when you got a woke uh, Supreme Court justice and they say, "How would you define a woman?" She says, "I can't." You'd have to talk to a biologist. So although I'm not a biologist, I've written the biology of men and women in this book. The research is all out there. It's very simple. Yeah, I know. And it's not even a, not even a medical doctor can tell now. No, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Except every medical treatment has to be either for women or for men. Yeah. There's very few that work for both or should work for both. Yeah, I don't. I mean, OB, OBGYNs are for women. I don't think they handle the prostate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, the, the culture is one. The other is pesticides. Uh, GMOs is a major oh. one. Pesticides, they're really? called hormone blockers. Also, our reliance on plastic bottles now. And this is all part of a, once they make the tap water toxic, which it's a certain degree, it's somewhat toxic. Now you have uh, people drinking bottled water all the time rather than from the faucet. And that bottled water where it is purified, no chlorine is in it. But what happens is uh, the plastic leaches into the water when it hits heat. And a lot of those plastic bottles have been in trucks and 
heat, the sun shining on those trucks, high temperatures, and literally it will bleed into the, into the water. And so you're getting, people now have plastic in their bloodstream. They can measure it. Wow. Almost everybody. Yeah. And, but that's called, that's a hormone disruptor. And what that does is it binds with a woman's estrogen, uh, her estrogen receptors in the body. When you bind with the estrogen receptor, it doesn't give you the benefits of estrogen, but it tells you, tells your brain that you've got plenty of estrogen. So it's a confusing thing. The body has never been exposed to plastic oh. in the whole history of humanity. Uh, and also millions of years of evolution, plastic hasn't been there. So it binds with estrogen receptor sites and it sends a message to a woman's brain that you have plenty of estrogen. So now you can be on your own for a while. So it's like if you're in a relationship where a man is taking care of you, you feel safe, secure, supported, happy, fulfilled. That's all estrogen going high. And then at a certain point, high estrogen is not required. Then you go more to your male side and do more what you want to do. Okay. So you shift from what I need to what I want. So when women, the, the experience that happens is when women get the message, they have plenty of estrogen, then they tend to automatically go over to develop their masculine side. So it tends to make you more of a tomboy and then more independent. And that's basically been written about in studies and so forth. And then you've got for males, it's just the opposite. We all have estrogen receptors as well. And when we get a message to the brain that we have a lot of estrogen, that basically means that we need to be less assertive. Because see, the male world, if we look at male monkeys, there's, there's called the pecking order, hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And if you're the lower and lower you are on the hierarchy, the more estrogen your body has. So you become more submissive and yielding to a bigger monkey. You don't, you don't try to do better than him. He'll fight you down. So it's dangerous mm -hmm. for you to express your power as a male if you've got a lot of estrogen. So, when, so biologically, that's an evolutionary way to explain a biological response that your body has to plastics if you're a male, which is you will actually produce less testosterone. You're now going to be more submissive rather than assertive, confident, uh, independent. So that's another one. Okay, so those are called hormone disruptors that interfere okay. with normal brain development. And then for males, a major aspect is they're not having their father. The father just... Being with the father creates dopamine and testosterone. Did the hormone of mother comes more serotonin, more relaxed energy comes. So, you know, Bonnie, my wife with our children, she says, okay, I'm putting them to bed. Now you go in the other room. They get too excited and have too much fun when you're here because we're the bet rum, rum, playful energy, so to speak. And even I have a puppy now and she's a girl, but when I come in the room, she's all excited when my partner comes into the room. <laughs> She's just like more calm, more relaxed. You know, she'll hold her and carry her <laughs> whereas I'm playing games with her. So naturally there's an, a, a response. If a male is with another male, his testosterone goes really high. Now, what happens is when testosterone goes really high, uh, it can be addictive. So that's why you go to your cave. What you do in your cave can either help rebuild normal levels of testosterone or it can create an addiction, which then mm. sustains lower testosterone. And one of the major things is uh, video games, it's a big cave activity that produces addiction and over time lowers testosterone. And you can see this, all of the video masters, uh, teenagers and so forth, they get big fat bellies. Uh, that means they're making more estrogen. Uh, the, the belly fat you see in men as they get older, that's because they're making more estrogen. And, and, and that, a little bit of that's fine, but if it gets too much, you're not, you can't make testosterone to be more than that. So there has to be, always be a balance in the male of his, bio, his biology as such. There has to be a balance of male hormones to female hormones. We know this very simply. People say, how do you know this? Well, most simply is if you look at a male, you'll see the range of healthy testosterone levels in a male. Mm -hmm. And it's about 10 to 20 times higher, depending on the man, than a woman. Okay. So a man needs 10 to 20 times more testosterone. If he doesn't have his quota of testosterone, he shows symptoms of depression, of anxiety, of anger. Ironically to people, they don't know this, is that anger in men is high estrogen and low testosterone. Women, on the other hand, when it comes to estrogen, need 10 times more, generally speaking, than a man needs for well-being. I need estrogen. I just don't need as much as a woman. And mm -hmm. then if, I, if I'm a woman and I want to have romantic feelings, uh, romantic feelings is the estrogen going from 10 times more to 20 times more. That's, that's the romantic uh, arousal that a woman can feel with a man if he's safe. Now, the, the danger for women on this as well, I mean, there's all kind of permutations and like paradoxes, but a woman can be in danger and, mm -hmm. and her estrogen levels will also go very high. Uh, she can be anticipating love and support and getting what she wants and her estrogen levels will go really high. So this is dopamine. Dopamine gets produced when you anticipate getting what you want, you're excited, or dopamine yeah. goes up when you're feeling danger. So a lot of women, when they feel danger, they get very aroused to the wrong men, <laughs> to the dangerous man. <laughs> And so, the, and so sometimes when I teach this ideas down in South America, where this whole macho idea is mm -hmm. literally 
I've had men say in the seminar and the women didn't get upset. Well, John, you're saying we should be really nice and supportive and respectful of women, but then they don't get turned on to you. You got to be tough. You got to slap them around. Then they get turned on. <laughs> it's crazy. Is Nobody, that their culture? I mean, I'm, and they say, is that well, partly their culture? I'm sorry. Is that partly their culture? Yes, that's their culture. And it's not ours. <laughs> no, it's not ours. But if you look at how much S&M is going on now, where people That's are true. whipped and degraded and negative mm -hmm. talk, humiliation talk, and all that mm -hmm. uh, can stimulate both either a man or a woman because we're so far out of mm -hmm. balance. See, we, we, need, yeah. we need the opposite of love to stimulate these hormones. Or you get the real love and it will stimulate your hormones. But then we have psychological problems. Psychological problems that people have today is they can't receive love. So when a woman's been really traumatized, she can't receive love. She tends to be attracted. It's called a, an anxious bonding with her father. Uh, when she has anxious yeah. bonding with her father, she will create a series of uh, sexual encounters, but the man will never call back because she's picking the wrong men. And so to the extent that she's using sexual attraction to pick a man, she will then be bored by a man who actually has the potential to provide for her the respect, the understanding and the caring that she needs. Her first encounter with him, he will seem very boring. He will and she'll go, oh, this is not exciting for me. But she's so bored because she's addicted to high stimulation. So you think yeah. these video games all day long and tell him now we're going to go walk in the park and go for a walk in the forest for, for a while. He's going to be completely bored. OK, completely. Because right. that's called desensitizing dopamine receptors. When when you have to have high stimulation, the dopamine receptors begin to close down. An example of this rather shocking is when you when you take cocaine, this is a red in the research, you take cocaine, the first time you take it, you lose 30% of your dopamine receptors. Now, dopamine receptors are necessary to be wow. happy. So some people who are just by nature more happy have more dopamine receptors, and that's part of their heritage, their, their uh, DNA. You have more dopamine receptors. That means when dopamine is being produced, it's going all the way on all these receptors. They're all getting it. Each one goes, yay, 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 yay. Other people, when they have less dopamine receptors, uh, the dopamine goes in and they go, oh, not so much, not so much, kind of boring, not happy, not anything. You, so mm -hmm. why do you lose 30%? Can you get them back? Yes, that's the good news. You just have to go through withdrawals. Mm -hmm. The withdrawals are feeling boy, mm -hmm. uh, bored and distressed and unhappy because you don't, you're not getting that high stimulation and it has to get higher mm -hmm. and higher because the higher it goes, this is the prayer, the brighter it is, the more of the receptors close down and now you're bored. So your brain goes, I need more of that drug. I need more of that drug. And that's addiction. Well, the, the video games are not cocaine, but they're up in that level. That's one. And then even bigger, close to cocaine is masturbating to porn. This, the, the average teenager today is doing it twice a day watching porn. Is that right? I had not read that. That's, That's so, interesting. Uh, it's, it's, some are doing it three or four times. Others are doing it once or twice. So you're average. You have to average it out. It's insane. Wow. It's insane. Wow. Know? And it starts around nine years old or 10 years old. They're watching porn. There's no there's nine or red, 10. Red. Yeah. They're nine or 10. And now you go to your kindergarten teacher. She'll teach you how to masturbate. That's what's being done today. That's why there's up outrage. Parents are outraged because they're seeing during the COVID thing, what parents are teaching now uh, and they're hiding what they're teaching now. They won't put it online, but they're talking all about choosing your sex. What sex are you? What is gay? What is straight? What is bisexual? How to masturbate? Masturbation is loving yourself. This is how, pleasuring yourself. What's wrong with pleasuring yourself. This is insanity. Uh, this should not be encouraged in children. It's a wake up uh, their sexuality before they're ready. You know, when children, when they're ticklish, that's actually, they're not ready. The same places where you're ticklish as a child can actually be erogenous zones as you get older, when you're ready for that. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's a very interesting thing. Very interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and if a woman does feel ticklish in sex, she should realize that's where I have sexual blocks and she needs more foreplay. And then those areas should be massaged. So she starts to open up her sexual energy in those different places. And, and that's what's going on with these kids. But they already have a challenge because the mothers, when they're pregnant, were exposed to plastics, pesticides. The mothers had hormonal imbalances. And there's some research from many years ago showing that when a girl is a, uh, uh, when she's a tomboy, uh, it was different hormones going on in the mother's body when the, the girl was born. However, after puberty, it will shift back. And to even know one's sexual identity is important. It's fantasy. It's it's just conditioning by out, outer forces for a child mm -hmm. before puberty to know whether they have masculine or feminine energy dominance. There is there is an exception. I mean, the, throughout history, there have always been some some men uh, who were attracted not attracted to women. So if you're not attracted to women, you became a monk or you became a shaman because it can be either 
from a, a healthy situation, or you can be not attracted to women because you had a very unhappy mother. And so if you're not attracted to women and you don't have a way to sublimate that energy through prayer and meditation and spirituality, then you start having loveless sex. And this is, this is basically, sex becomes an addiction rather than expression of love. Uh, you'll see that's why porn is so addictive is because there's no love there. You just, it's like when mm -hmm. I eat ice cream, I love ice cream, but I don't love a person. You see, <laughs> it's a, you know, you're, you're not loving your computer. You're loving a fantasy. So your energy just gets lost. There's no real love there. And this weakens us as human beings. It closes our hearts. Uh, you see that males are doing that. And then you also got all the gay males are doing. Uh, it's very sad. You know, you ask why they die earlier. They have more sickness and more disease. It's just like what I say to heterosexual men. You're having too much sex without love. Well, they can go and have sex with 10 guys in one night. There's no love there. Uh, they love sex. See, so whether it be gay people, whether whatever your choice is, you can just make sure there's love there. And love is commitment. It's not like a stranger. A stranger will always activate high levels of dopamine like cocaine desensitize the brain. So now you're dependent upon a stranger to feel the passion that comes when your testosterone goes up. And over time, the testosterone keeps going down, down, down. And now it's the norm in the Western world. Men's testosterone levels go down in all ages are going down 1% every year. Uh, for me, I'm 70 years old, mine have gone up 50%. Uh, it's just a standard. It's because I practiced how to be a man and respect a woman. And I have a woman who's more feminine than me. In, in the partner I have now, uh, she wasn't more feminine. I made her more feminine. Women are feminine I, by learning how to treat her with respect, with understanding, with empathy, mm -hmm. with gestures, with expressions of love. So there's, there's, sex is everything when it comes to marriage. You, that's what's most sacred about uh, a marriage is you don't have sex with anybody else. And if you're doing porn, right. you're having sex with somebody else. If you're, but we're you're also, we're also, excuse me, we're also told that that is love. That all these things are love. Where they use that word for masturbation for everything. It's always yeah, love. That's, that's loving yourself. Well, if that's yeah, loving yeah. yourself, why do you feel so awful afterwards? And they say, "Well, I have right. to love myself. We have to make this into some kind of sacred act." It's not a sacred act. You just lost life force. Now, mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I speak with confidence on this, and I'm a big teacher of this, which because for me, celibacy. Well, I was a monk. Okay, so I could oh. easily. Yeah, I, I did it mainly because I wanted to get high. Uh, you know, I'm a '60s hippie. And taking drugs makes you high, but you crash down. And then the Beatles said, you can learn to meditate. They went off to India. So I went off to India. I went to be with the Maharishi. I became his personal assistant. I was number one student. I practiced, oh, wow. pure, I didn't know that. <laughs> I practiced pure celibacy for nine, for nine years from 18 to 28. And as a teenager, I was very sexually active. And now I love sex, but and I also love getting high. That was the drugs. And so I wanted to be like the master meditator. And to this day, mm -hmm. today I meditate three hours. I've, my life, my success is founded on taking that sexual energy and bringing it up. So that's how you can be celibate and use that energy as a, a writer or a singer or some creative talent. You're using the energy rather than wasting it. You're just throwing it away. Or you fall in love with a woman and you respect her and you serve her and you do the things that will help bring happiness to her, create safety for her. That is selflessness. And the great thing about a relationship is that by giving to your partner, not only are they happy, but when a woman is happy, a man is happy. Our happiness is hugely enriched when we can provide happiness to, to a person. Then my philosophy, you know, my partner is always saying to me, you're just so generous. How can you be so generous? I say, actually, I'm very selfish as well. I could have a million dollars and give a dollar to a million women, or I can give a million dollars to one woman. She's going to be really happy. And that's going to make me very happy. See, that's the simple logic. And yet, you know, every time you're going around giving your energy out, there's no more th more powerful energy than sexual energy. If it comes up to the love, it opens your heart and then it goes up to your brain and it makes you creative. It makes you peaceful. And so in the past where men, either they, they didn't have fathers and happy mothers. And so they weren't drawn to the female. Uh, what they did is they would become, they would become monks so they could sublimate that mm -hmm. energy rather than taking cocaine. When a man has sex with a man, it's like taking cocaine and they get addicted to it because male on male energy creates more and more intensity. So it will produce more testosterone. So boys who basically aren't drawn to the female, making a woman happy to raise your testosterone. They can also raise their testosterone by loveless encounters with a male. Okay. Just as we heterosexual guys can have loveless encounters with a female whose fantasy, the testosterone rises and it crashes down. And I'm not saying hey, every, gay, every gay man's like this, but the ones that are having eight loveless sex encounters, they're losing their life force. That just is a sad, sad story. And this is why uh, if you look at statistics, they live, they live shorter lives. 
They're also really? like, for sicknesses. Yeah, you have to look at it. It's there. Nobody just wants to talk about it because it says, oh, they're bad to do. They're not bad. They're just more balanced. They have the potential to be more balanced within themselves. If they're not drawn to the female, they can find the female side of them through prayer, through spirituality, through selfless service, and don't, don't waste your life force through loveless sex because it's just a temporary thing. They can't make commitment. They have to, they can have a committed partner over here. I, I have uh, gay friends and th that's like their parenting partner. You know, they adopt a child and they love their partner. They're good friends. They don't have sex anymore. They can't sustain sex with one person over a long time. Loveless sex creates a feeling of shame and disgust and it's a, and it should be there. There's nothing wrong. If I kill somebody, I should feel ashamed of myself. Okay. That's a bad thing to do. I feel bad about that. Don't tell me not to feel bad about that. You can tell me I have to forgive myself, but it's a normal reaction that we have to honor is when we do something that's not life supporting, we feel bad. And, and somebody want to come along and say, oh, you want to go masturbate? You feel bad? Oh, don't feel bad. Everybody does it. It's okay. It's loving yourself. It's pleasuring yourself. No, it's decreasing your ability to be turned on to the opposite sex. It's cre and, and, and someone with who you love. And this is a challenge in loving relationships. Mm -hmm. There's interest in their wives because they don't have communication skills with a fascinating woman who can boost his testosterone and a man who's respectful of women by understanding their needs. It's a two-way street. One, it has to be both mm -hmm. sides. And that keeps your hormones up. Most couples just depend upon newness uh, to experience passion. Like I was counseling one man, every three years, he runs out of passion with a woman. That's it. Last three years and it's done. And then he moves on to the next, moves on to the next. Because his attitude and approach to a woman doesn't generate enough testosterone in him. And his partner doesn't respond in a way that would generate testosterone in him. But I never put it just on the woman. And I don't never put it just on the man. It's We are responsible for the results we get. I know how Bonnie, when she read your mother's book, Fascinating Womanhood, now your updated version, which takes it into a more modern day, when women don't understand that, they constantly sabotaging their power in a relationship and they think they're doing everything right. You know, oh, she's overgiving, overgiving, doing things for him all the time rather than letting him do things for her and then be appreciative of it. That's what men bond. Men bond, their testosterone goes up when they feel valued and appreciated. Another reason, I gave you three reasons uh, mm -hmm. for the, the, the addictions that males have today. They go to their cave, but in their cave, they're doing unproductive things like long hours of video games. The other one, of course, is masturbation and, and um, pornography. It's a, a huge, huge addiction. Oh. Um, and, and you have to go through withdrawals and you have to know how to do it. You know, I was just instructing a man today on how to do it. He's massively addicted. What do you go through? There's a whole bunch of uh, websites which are dedicated to this called NoFab. N-O-F-A-B. And there's all these males that talk about, I feel better. I have more energy. I don't procrastinate. I'm happier in my life. I've got, I sleep better. Every possible benefit you can want, these men start to feel. And it's amazing because they weren't feeling it before. See, I feel it all the time. I don't have any of those problems. So I, I don't notice that much. You know, there's this book, a wonderful book called The Love Languages, which helps people. Although I yes, have I love languages, my book too. But the mine are, men need to feel anything that makes them feel valued and appreciated, acceptance, not rejected and trusted. For women, they need messages that say, I care about you. I understand you. I respect you. But you have five love languages. It's good to point out what you like. But the bottom line is every one of those love languages produces estrogen in your partner. <laughs> so basically, women, you need to work on all five of them. And he needs to learn those are the most important things for you. And what's more important to him than any of those is that when he provides that for you, that you open your heart and you appreciate him and you learn to accept his imperfections and you stop complaining, all the things you'll suggest in your book. But that, that's a woman's natural response with a little education if a man does those five languages for her. But the mm -hmm. point of that book, which I do like very much, is that different people have different priorities. And so it's like, oh, you're different from me. So, all right, instead of you should like that, maybe you're different. And so you don't have to like what, what I did. But the real thing is understand on a deep, primitive, primal, uh, on a primal level, the power, most powerful uh, energy is sex. Because without sex, there's no evolution. So it is a priority. That's why it can be so pleasurable. Nature makes it so that you really want that. But how do you now get out of the mindless, unconscious state of being a monkey and instead are a lion? Uh, and you, you feel that part of you, but now you bring it up into your heart and then you bring it into your mind and you control it. You're not a wild animal that just goes after anybody. You're, you control it to where you're prioritizing it just for one woman, hence monogamy. And you prioritize that for her. That creates more safety and security for her because women are constantly living next to the clock. In the 30s, they know I need to make a baby soon. If I don't make a baby, it might be too late. So they've got that pressure. Then as they get, get older, they're not as physically attractive as they were in the beginning. What's attractive about her is what's in her heart. That's the, it's like, that's where all the attraction is anyway. I tell women in my classes, I say, look, I was married before Bonnie for a couple of years and we didn't have the heartfelt connection. 
I wasn't more the masculine and she wasn't more the feminine. It was kind of a role reversal. And after a year and a half of having sex with a naked, beautiful woman, I couldn't believe that no arousal to her at all. Physical. Really? Thing, physical yeah, it was a shock to me, you know, and this young guy, you know, you see a naked woman when you have sex with you, you really get excited, at least if, if someone you're naturally drawn to. And I loved having sex with her. And then at a certain point, I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't. I was shocked because we didn't have that emotional reciprocity. She was more masculine than me. She was more the go-getter. She was always in the love languages. She's always complimenting me, always serving me, always giving to me. And I was like, okay, great. Do everything you want for me. That's my estrogen was going higher. And I just didn't understand that dynamic. And because the relationship didn't support her, her potential to raise my testosterone, my potential to raise her estrogen. When you have a relationship that's based on men, men being more masculine, women being more feminine, what you have is the, the magnetic attraction, and therefore you're no longer dependent upon newness to produce that magnetic attraction. And that's inevitable in all marriages, the newness will go away. Mm -hmm. you know, like in the Bay Area, you'll see couples who, you know, they elicit a third partner to come in and have th threesomes just to bring in something new and different. Uh, these are then the polyamorous community, you know, they take turns mm -hmm. being with different people and, and, and they're happy. I have friends who do this stuff. I say, yeah, you're happy. You don't know what you're missing. If we love ourselves in a healthy way by loving others in a healthy way. And monogamy is a foundation for that. It's just, that's the essence of it. And then learning how to feel pleasure in sex. I'm talking to the men for a moment and be aware. Why am I having the sex? Yeah. It, I can have ice cream. It's pleasurable but I'm feeling the pleasure so I can get in touch with my feelings of love for my partner. See, pleasure causes us to feel when something's not pleasurable, we resist. And so we just have a resistance when there's pleasure, there's openness and openness allows us to get in touch with what we feel. And as you feel more love, express that love. If this is, this has been known uh, for thousands of years, but it was always kept secret. And the reason mm -hmm. it's kept secret is because not everybody could do it. See, people were just too primitive, but we're at a stage now in our evolution. If you're wanting to experience lasting love, passion, those types of things many people want, then you're at the stage of consciousness where you can learn to do this, but you need instruction. Nobody teaches this. It's really, you know, I was listening to a guy online just last night. He also teaches it. And he said it took him with a teacher uh, eight, year, eight years to learn. And then five years, he's been doing it quite easily. I'd say it took me 30 years to learn because I didn't have a teacher. But, and I still practiced it. I still did it, but I would get blue balls. So it was painful. <laughs> and now I realize I just didn't have some of the techniques that I've developed. I mentioned a few of them today, but men can learn this. This is something that's possible. And that will keep, at, so as a 70 year old, I'm 50% uh, higher testosterone levels all the time. But the average male, when he, when he had, this is really good information for men and for women also to understand. Passion inside of men is directly correlated with high testosterone. Okay. His testosterone has to go up in your presence. And that also helps to raise a woman's estrogen, just that his testosterone goes up in her presence. How does her body know? It's a smell, pheromones. When a man's pheromones increase in the presence of his partner, her estrogen levels will increase. When her estrogen levels increase in the presence of her partner, his testosterone will increase. That's called making love. We're building it all back up. So then traditionally what couples do, they have sex on Saturday night. And he ejaculates, then he pulls back. There's a, a hormone that gets produced that causes him to become disinterested in sex. So, so he, he literally withdraws. Now, if a man waits six days before he has sex again with his partner, on the seventh day, his testosterone levels will increase 50%. If he has sex on Saturday night, then it goes back down to his baseline, whatever it is. And then he has sex on Tuesday, which is kind of the average Tuesday or Wednesday. Couples typically will have sex twice a week because they're their pressure is like how everybody wants to know how much sex everybody's having. <laughs> you know, I want to keep up with the Joneses, you know, what's a healthy sex life, whatever, but there's this pressure. Then what happens is he has sex on Saturday night. It goes down to baseline. Testosterone goes to his baseline. He has sex starting out having sex on, on Tuesday or Wednesday. He's at baseline. He's not at 50% higher. And then mm -hmm. after he has sex, he's still at baseline Saturday night. He'll be at baseline. He'll always be at baseline. The research shows if, for a young man, if you go six days without ejaculating, on the seventh day, you'll suddenly have this high boost of testosterone, which I've always practiced, by the way. And, and most of the time I was doing without ejaculating. But if I did ejaculate, I'd wait a period of time before having sex again without feeling the pressure to have it. Because if you go a day without eating and you eat the next day, it's fantastically delicious. This is just simple biology. All of our pleasure receptors, they need time to open up again, like when you have the high dopamine hit of porn or the high dopamine hit of cocaine, the receptors shrink. 
They actually don't go away, <laughs> but they completely shrink, become unusable. But if you didn't, don't stimulate it for a while, it will rise back up. And then when then the dopamine comes in, you get this huge, big experience. Your testosterone levels go higher. They will come back down. There's always an up and down in relationships until a man learns how to never ejaculate. If you just learn not to ejaculate, but also have sex. That's the key. If you just don't ejaculate, uh, you can be just denying a part of you. And, and then you use up that energy, uh, and, and like overeating or taking drugs or addictions. Or if you, if you be in a healthy way for single people so that men are not wasting their energy, is that you do something creative with that energy. You don't stroke yourself. You go take a cold shower and then go do something. Or you go jogging for a little while. It will go away. And then do something creative. Mm -hmm. creative energy. That sex energy is creative energy. It's, it's service energy as well. Uh, confront some problems of someone outside yourself. Do something. The sex energy will go away. It actually goes into doing as opposed to denying it. And you always want to have an openness uh, to creating a sexual partner and being in a monogamous relationship. And if you're not wasting that energy, the intelligence and the wisdom and motivation will be there to create a relationship, which is totally natural. And our whole society is now a narrative. This is going in the wrong direction. I call anything going in the wrong direction is what is, we would often say in, is evil. Okay. Which is the direction is to normalize non heterosexual relationships to denormalize to denormalize heterosexual relationships and family values, which includes, includes raising your children yourselves by your loving values and whatever spiritual context you have, as opposed to them sending to a school where you can't even pray uh, to a coach who's going to go to jail, lose his job if he thanks God for something. This is the godless society that we have. And I'm not preaching any religion. I'm just saying, we look at what's going on. We have a godless society. Now, do you want your teacher teaching your children about God? No, you don't want that. They just have to find the balance, but we have to have huge respect for spirituality mm -hmm. rather than hatred and disdain. And we shouldn't be teaching our children about the negatives of the past. You, you have to become adult. Yeah. You need to be a full adult before you can see the negative of the past, but see why that was better than the previous past and to see why that was better than the previous past. If I told you I had a great childhood, my father was a great, wonderful man. He did his best to serve our family. Now, my father also, I found that later <laughs> at, a, at a funeral when he died, I saw there, there was a woman from another city who looked just like my sister. <laughs> so I, I went to my mother. I said, first I went to her. I said, well, how did you know my dad? She said, oh, he was always so nice to my family. He loved my mother. He bought my car. He helped pay my college education. He's always so nice to us. What a nice man. Clearly that was, <laughs> it was this other woman in his life. I wouldn't, I told my mother, I said, mom, I think I have a sister here. Uh, it, it, she knows dad bought her a car and paid her college education. And this is my mother's response. She said, I've always known your father had other responsibilities. And I said, well, didn't that upset you? And she said, you know, in my generation, if a man could take care of his family and something else came along, as long as he did his duty and took care of his family, a woman, a woman was fine with that. And what she meant by that, I had to translate a lot. They stopped having sex like so many couples do together. Oh. You know, like, like me, he's a virile sexual guy. And so they stopped having sex. He started having a relationship outside. My mother understood just like it's been done for centuries when powerful men who have money also can find another woman to have a mistress. Okay. Now, if you don't have money, no, a woman doesn't want to be your mistress. <laughs> so it's, it's, but that's a low level of consciousness. See, that's one level down. Their relationship was harmonious, was loving because my dad was a good provider and never got angry at my mother. Okay. He was, he was a policeman. She had boys. She could say, I'll tell your father. So he served his purpose. That was the traditional relationship, man provider, woman homemaker, and they were happy. But today that's not enough for women. And it's not enough for men. We want mm -hmm. passion. And part of what your mother had the awareness of how to fascinating womanhood, how to keep the attraction, your books you've carried on. And that's what I do in my books is teach women how to be receptive, how to be feminine, how to communicate feminine values so that motivate a man in, and that pulls out the best in him. Well, I, I just, this has been really fascinating, pardon the, pardon the pun, <laughs> uh, talking with you. And I really appreciate because you've taught me some things I did not know. And you've addressed this subject really well, which I appreciate. And I'm seeing all those beautiful books back there. I, I knew you wrote some other books, but I didn't know you wrote so many. So that's really great to know. And I appreciate this so much. Well, Dixie, I'd like everybody listening to know that there's the basic men are from Mars. And now there's the one 25 years later, which is beyond Mars and Venus which is relationship mm -hmm. skills for today's complex world. And it's- And I have that. I yeah. got that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Good. Good. yeah. Let's go for it. And then another one, if you're not having great sex every week, uh, here's another book called Mars and Venus in the Bedroom. And I was actually number one bestseller on New York Times for one year straight. Fantastic book. 
And it's not, I didn't teach in that book though, how to be multi-orgasmic without ejaculating. Cause I didn't have the research showing that when you don't have sex so much, men's testosterone levels increase. And then, then they have the potential to learn how to be multi-orgasmic. That's the next, next level for men to go to. And there's some wonderful books on that subject. I haven't written that subject yet. I need to teach it more. Uh, I didn't teach it because you've got to back up these crazy ideas. Now, well, this has been really interesting and, and really informative. And I appreciate you talking about this subject about boys too. And I feel like I've taken so much of your time, but thank you so much for, for doing this with me. Well, I'm very happy to do it, Dixie. I feel indebted to you. I just want you to know, <laughs> and your mother, <laughs> fascinating woman, and I'm so grateful for that. And I'll have to check out your new book. I look forward to that. Well, and- I'd be happy to send you a copy if you'd like. Oh, that'd just, be very nice. That'd be very nice. Somebody can send me. Somebody can send me a physical address. I can. I can a physical uh, one. Or I can do an e one. Whatever you it's, like. It's, you know, Dixie. I will go online and buy it. Uh, you deserve that. So. Well, I mean, this is this is what it looks like. So you know what it looks like. Okay, fascinating woman. Fascinating woman for the timeless woman. Okay, for the timeless woman. I love it. Well, yeah. I'm getting there. Yeah. I wish you the very okay. best. Thank you. You too, John. Bye bye.